Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World, which is India's first future tech meets sustainability podcast. And today, I'm delighted and honored to have with me Mr. Dinesh Verma, who is an IBM Fellow and IBM Research Chief Scientist for Research Consulting Program. He has served various roles at IBM, including CTO, Strategist, Chief Scientist, and Senior Management, and has worked on projects related to autonomic computing, policy-based networking, network science, mobile networks, wireless networks, Internet of Things, and cognitive computing. So Mr. Dinesh, really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. Today's conversation is around Internet of Things and the future of computing. So I think it'd be great if you could start from explaining the concept of the Internet of Things and what are the key challenges and opportunities in realizing the full potential of IoT in industries and sectors? Uh, no, absolutely. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, Internet of Things is uh, uh, essentially referring to a case where ordinary life things that we have, for example, machines in the manufacturing plant or appliances in our house, like whether it be washers or dryers, they're all connected to the internet. And connection, uh, connecting those uh, equipment to the internet, whether they be at home or on the factory production floor or in the office or inside a building can confer many distinct advantages. The first of all, uh, like it leads to a lot of things and a lot of capabilities being done in software. And once you do things in software, all of these appliances would hopefully become simpler and more easier to maintain. Many of the problems that arise or the smarts that you want to do can be implemented into the uh, machine much more easily and, and cheaply. So for example, let's consider something like a, a cement manufacturing plant. India produces a lot of cement. It needs a lot of cement for, uh, like, you know, for building out the infrastructure. If you look at the general cement product production plant, you can produce it using some static machines and things, which is how cement production has been done for several uh, decades, or even you can say maybe centuries, right? But if you put certain computing intelligence into those cement uh, production equipment, you can essentially control the quality better. You can check for the water temperature. You can perform more checks. If the cement production plant, say machine is making little wobbly or slightly get slightly out of thing, audio and video sensors can detect it and then they can correct it so that expensive equipment does not uh, like no, uh, get uh, um, damaged. So that reduces the probability of problems, uh, like that increases the quality of cement that is being produced, that improves the long longevity and the, how uh, effective the machines would be, and it confers a lot of other benefits in trying to manage, control the amount, etc. Now I'm giving cement uh, production as an example. You can have similar things for tracking bridges, for tracking road infrastructure. You can have similar things in the household. Although, uh, given the way Indian household is like, no, um, there are the distribution of household uh, wealth. Uh, perhaps the internet IoT in home may be a longer term proposition for India, but definitely IoT in manufacturing. IoT in our infrastructure, whether it be home or building, can be and should be of immediate impact to India. So, but how is this different from digital twins? Uh, and and, and it will be great if you could share some real world examples of how IoT has been successfully applied to improve efficiency. You're talking about productivity or quality of life in the public sector. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, first of all, digital twin, you can view that as a subset of the Internet of Things. The when you connect the physical assets to digital world, or when you connect these objects that typically we won't uh, consider as a, in IT or like no computing uh, computers to the computing paradigm, you can do many different things. Like no, some of these could refer to smarts like uh, a robot going around checking things. Now, digital twin happens to be a special subset of Internet of Things. In digital twin, what we do is that for every physical asset that is there. We create a replica of that in the uh, in the digital side. So, for example, if you have to um, uh, change the configuration of the system or you want to optimize it, instead of trying it immediately on the physical thing, you can first try it on, say, on the digital twin. And the digital twin can then allow you to um, map and do things uh, on the in the explore a lot more on the cyber world 
than you try to do on the physical thing. One copy of the digital twin, for example, like, you know, suppose you have got in a, in a car, you want to um, check the fuel injection, right? Now, the shape of the nozzle of the fuel injector has a tremendous impact on how much petroleum goes out, how much fuel is, how efficiently it's burnt, etc. Now, you can have the car, you can create a digital equi uh, equivalent of that car. And in those simulations, you can study what happens if I change the nozzle in a certain different shapes. So that for a particular car configuration for that particular thing, you would be able to figure out for that car, what type of equipment or what type of nozzle is the best. So that allows you to then not disturb the physical thing, but in the simulation medium, figure out what the best way to operate or best way to upgrade, configure that particular car would be. So Digital Twin has that particular benefit, but Digital Twin is just one part of IoT. Another segment of IoT is simply collecting, using uh, sensors to collect information from the uh, equipment, from the physical asset, and use that to understand what the physical asset is going through. So for example, like you know, if you have got put camera and um, acoustic sensors on a physical device, like the device could be a, a well, washer dryer device could be a, a manufacturing equipment, or the device could be like, you no, know, um, in a station when trains are going back and forth, you hear the sounds of the vehicles, you hear the, um, uh, the uh, you take the pictures of the vehicle, and now you just send it back to a computer so that it can analyze and see what the problems are. So let's take an example, which is a real world example. Uh, like you have got trains rolling into a train station. As they go by the uh, marshalling yard of the train station, Imagine there's a high-speed camera and the camera is going to take pictures of the wheels and also listen to the sounds of the wheels as the train goes by. Suppose there's a loose nut in the train. We probably won't hear it or the person who goes around checking the train when it's stopped in the station may not always observe it. But the camera and sensors could observe those slight wobble in the train wheel or a slight loose nut from the sound or the video uh, uh, images and they could alert the person that, hey, there's a small problem in the train. The train needs, uh, like, a certain equipment needs fixing. And that improves the safety and security of people who are traveling on the train. Or if it's a good strain, make sure that the goods are being traveled and sent properly. You have uh, many such and similar examples of using the connected uh, information from physical asset to improve, make sure that the things are running better. Uh, the other benefit when you collect information, say, for example, in the in a manufacturing plant like, is that you can collect information uh, say for a steel manufacturing plant over the years or over the hours of what the information is being created what the uh, what the uh, stress on the equipment is how much uh, it produces when it when you increase the volume what it uh, whether the thing wobbles or not and all that can be used for long term production optimization so you can optimize the system, you can make um, factories run at the optimum peak capacity. And all of that advantages translates directly to a reduced cost of production and increased efficiency. How, how does the workflow go about? What's the process? What's the tech uh, workflow of creating this Internet of Things? Uh, so I'll give you a couple of examples. So let's say that you already have a equipment which comes with a lot of sensors. If you look at any, say, um, uh, equipment used to say fabricate semiconductors or lay out the chips. Those equipment come with a lot of sensor data and they monitor and they create a lot of data itself. In those cases, the internet of things is fairly easy. You basically take the data that the equipment is producing, you pipe it to a server. The server, depending on the volume, could be locally on the premises of the production facility or if it's um, uh, if it is more efficient or economically more viable, you can ship it to a data center or a cloud site for processing. But in that case, the equipment is already pre-installed uh, pre with sensors. You are just monitoring the sensors. You are basically uh, then analyzing those sensors onto uh, on a server. And depending on which software paradigm you want to use, what platforms you like to use, there are different ways of structuring the software that analyzes the sensor information. Now, let's look at another alternate. You have got some old equipment. The old equipment does not have any pre-installed sensor. Then you can essentially you, uh, install external sensors. You can install, say, cameras. You can install uh, acoustic sensors. You can even have other type of monitoring sensors that can be done. 
that's a little bit more hectic. I mean, a like, little bit more onerous because you are adding something on top of the uh, existing thing. But then once you have those cameras or acoustic sensors or any other system installed, you basically can pretty much send that over the network and uh, collect that information and process it in the same way. Uh, the other case that you had mentioned was Digital Twin. In the case of Digital Twin, a lot of time the information is done not during the production but off-site because you may want to be designing the right nozzle for an automobile before the automobile goes into production. In which case, the Internet of Things or the Digital Twin essentially uh, generally would be in a lab equipment or lab setting where you have the test uh, phys uh, the test sub set up the physical asset and the system there which you can equip with your experimental sensors and then feed them into the digital twin to create the equivalent simulation and then analyze and process the simulation in different ways so depending on the uh, type of special uh, the type of application domain the setup that you have you would have different type of setup and solutions to create it if you were to abstract out the typical IoT application would be a bunch of sensors out in the field. The sensors collecting the data information, uh, you would have that communicating over a network to some kind of IoT server. And the IoT server will be pro performing the processing functions and capabilities. Concurrent to that processing, then you typically would have a management system. And the management system would take care of the health of the IoT sensors, make sure that those sensors are up alive, uh, manage their resiliency, etc. So in that sense, it is uh, pretty much structured very much like any other traditional computer software would be. Because if you look at how computer software, at least the ones in production work, you have a bunch of servers, you have generally endpoint either phones or um, computers generating information sources coming to a bunch of servers. And then in addition to those servers, you have people managing and looking for security, performance, uh, uptime set aspects. So it's the same picture which uh, you are doing in the IoT. The only difference being that the information source is from a, a, like, no, a physical asset. Uh, I mean, you can almost argue that uh, given the prevalence of IoT and sensors and embedding, they really the no real difference or the difference between a physical asset and a computing asset is going to disappear in very uh, short term future. But at least at the moment when we still distinguish between physical assets and computing assets, the change of the end client is the only difference between IoT and a standard software system. Right. I, I think the world is changing so fast. You know, I mean, we, we've been thrusted into the virtual or the digital world post-COVID. You know, we've all been, you know, leveraging remote work, remote healthcare, remote education, so, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And yes, with the IoT, I think, you know, we, we'll be getting into a world which is completely connected, where I think almost every physical uh, assets is going to be sensorized and those sensor those information is going to help us better uh, understand the those uh, assets uh, and, and things like that and once we have like the better worse and spatial computing layer I, I, I think the lines are going to get blurred and like you pointed out the lines of the physical versus digital is, is will, will start uh, blurring out could, could you share some innovative use cases of IOTs which have kind of uh, caught your attentions both in the space of industry as well as uh, consumers? Oh, no, absolutely. So some of the cases of IoT is uh, one very useful case is that of inspection of civil infrastructure using both robots and drones. Uh, for example, we had a project in which we took a robotic dog and have the robotic dog walk around buildings and things, and they will just will inspect for things like uh, uh, observe uh, if a fire extinguisher is missing or they'll observe if the building structure has a crack. Like, you know, in sense, uh, we also had a, a experimental pilot with a chemical plant in which basically the dog would go around and the robot will basically check whether or not the there has been a spill occurring or there's any sign of uh, like you know, uh, corrosion or decomposition in the building infrastructure. Uh, you can also do that with UAVs and drones flying around, but there are restrictions on how you operate UAVs and drones and having something walk around on the device itself could be done uh, quite a bit. Another set of experiments, which I personally enjoyed a lot, was using acoustics to analyze and understand uh, how the, uh, say, the building elevators or the air and cooling systems inside large complexes work. In the building that uh, we work in, 
almost all commercial buildings, there's a big engine rooms and these engine rooms operate your um, heating and cooling equipment. They operate your water pumps. They operate your lifts and elevators. And many of that equipment has got life cycle of 30, 40 years, several uh, decades. And basically we install acoustic sensors in those. And we use those, uh, using the acoustic sensors, you could essentially uh, understand uh, when the equipment is, has, is showing um, signs of failures and signs of uh, wear and tear. So anything unusual happens, you could basically alert the person and help the maintenance. One specific um, case that we had done was with a wave making company. This was a company that tested uh, shipping vehicles and it made waves in those um, uh, uh, to test the ships and in their simulation thing. Now for those wave making machines, they wanted to know how long it has been operational because after certain hours of operation, a technician had to come and like, no, uh, perform some kind of maintenance. And the since the equipment of these have multiple decades, they didn't have a uh, like no, they didn't have any kind of sensor to monitor when it was on and off. So we put a small acoustic sensor next to the engine, and using that something very simple, we could just track when the engine was on and how long it has done for, and that basically gave a better time and alert for the technician to come and deal with the maintenance of the system. Uh, now, in some sense, you can say, okay, how much did you gain? And the thing is that, especially in those cases where you have got technicians coming from a distance, having them not come and say, oh yeah, the doesn't seem like you have run the system at, at all, is uh, like no, saves a lot of uh, both time expense and at least human hassle in uh, trying to perform those things. Uh, other type of um, uh, things, of course, have been looking at various type of uh, uh, other sensor data, sensor information that is coming from uh, the fields or deployed information. So, for example, we had a project, experimental project that we did with certain universities where we had a camera and the camera uh, was trying to observe if there is a sound. Like, say, for example, you are in a civil infrastructure or a road and you see a sound of a gunshot. Then the cameras will basically go deviate uh, automatically towards that site of a gunshot because you uh, generally wouldn't have, it's sort of expensive to deploy cameras throughout and monitor the entire screen, not to speak of the uh, concern about privacy that would raise, but having a few cameras which basically could detect and uh, collect any information from any uh, like no sound or anything could help a lot towards public safety. So coordinating different sen um, uh, sensors and things was also really good. Uh, we had an experiment in which we also used sound to analyze how people are playing tennis sports. So we could essentially look at the sound and then use that to understand uh, like, you know, what type of stroke was being played in a tennis match and therefore get a better an annotation or better commentary and give advice to people on how to improve their game shot. So there have been quite a bunch of uh, uh, variations and things that one could do. I also wanted to mention a project that, as a matter of fact, and this is an IoT project that my daughter did as part of the Engineers for Sustainable World, which was simple yet quite effective. So she, uh, like in Indonesia, they have these um, uh, mini power generation plant. So as part of the Engineers for Sustainable World, they, went, they made a small IoT sensor, which basically on, on a Raspberry Pi, they would just monitor the power consumption of the microelectric plant and using a cheap uh, cellular phone, um, occasionally like, you no, know, collect and send that information to a central server. And essentially what happened was that when you created these small uh, information and the items, you could track when the uh, uh, this mini power generation plant was not generating power or was showing signs of some kind of variations. So people can go and fix it. It's a small, like, you no, know, not very, doesn't require a lot of sophistication or doesn't require a great amount of AI or intelligence, just simple analytics, but it's incredibly helpful to those people. I would conclude by two other projects that we are involved in as part of an open source alliance. So one is a, a project where, um, uh, this is part of an open source alliance called the Enterprise Neurosystem Group, which I'm involved in. And one of the uh, projects that they have is they have created sensors for, to help monitor the health of beehives. So they created a small sensor, it's put into beehives, and that basically from the sound of the bees and so on, you could track how healthy the bees are, the hive is, 
And that kind of is a proxy measure for the health of the environment. Another interesting case that we are doing is uh, we are doing a project with Tanzania. And in that project, we are basically essentially trying to give techniques so that the farmers can essentially be able to monitor the health of the crop and they could make decisions as to whether or not they have to irrigate the water in the crop because oftentimes the just from a casual inspection you don't know if the uh, if the crop needs water or not and water is wherever water is scarce you want to you don't want the crop to die because of lack of watering but you don't want to overwater either so we have got a project which is trying to uh, advise the uh, farmers in Tanzania on when they can how they can use the water resources more effectively lovely lovely how cool is that and and uh, it's normally you know when you when we talk about iot you, you don't kind of intuite that audio could be playing a huge role and through most of the use cases that you mentioned about you know you spoke about acoustic sensors and how uh, sound is being leveraged to kind of monitor and better understand a, a system how cool is this and and in the course of the conversation you also mentioned that you know you you, you could also your, your daughter created uh, a basic uh, IoT experience. So, so there are like right from industry use cases to even maybe like like power grids or maybe, you know, like things yeah. that, that can be done in, in, a, in a very you know, beautiful way. Now, uh, artificial intelligence, you know, this it, it's, it's uh, advancing, uh, accelerating at a very, very rapid pace. You know? So what are some of the innovative way in which AI and IoT go hand, uh, you know, hand in hand? to create like a smarter and more intelligent system? Oh, no, absolutely. So uh, as we discussed, the IoT is essentially, you can view them as a set of sensor generation. And as you mentioned, uh, I, I focus a lot on acoustic because I had been measuring in some of or leading certain projects on acoustic. But essentially, the sensor could generate data of any type. The data could be a video because a lot of camera info generates a lot of useful information, acoustic being one. You can also have other, like you know, if you've got smarter sensors, you can have IR sensors, you can have UV sensors, you can have uh, like you no know, touch sensors or earthquake sensors, seismic sensors. So any type of sensor data can be part of the IoT device. Now, when the data gets generated, you have to analyze the data. Now, how you analyze the data can be accelerated a whole lot with these artificial intelligence technologies. And if you look at, say, uh, before, say, the rise of generative AI, if you look at the traditional, what we'll call the more traditional AI or machine learning, it would do things like uh, solve problems like anomaly detection. So you can essentially, and you want to use the data, say, for example, you want to know if your machine is performing well or not. Is your car engine ha having a problem or not? You generally want to have some kind of anomaly detection. Uh, like the other thing is like you know, <clears throat> the class of uh, problem that AI solves, there is that of classification. You take a picture, and you decide if the picture is that of a part which is manufactured properly or is the part faulty. So you, when you try to classify into different categories, the classification algorithms help significantly in processing the IoT data. You have other type of information, for example, uh, clustering information or clustering data into multiple groups to figure out what the characteristics are and try to create uh, different uh, labels for the information. That again is something that artificial intelligence does and is tremendously useful. So uh, as far as the premise of IoT is that you're connecting the physical to the digital and the physical world is generating a lot of data, you have to process the data. And the processing the data is where AI comes in. The other part which AI will come in is in what I'll call the management aspect. As we said, uh, there are two parts. One sensor generates data, a server processes the data. And the other side is like, well, you have got these physical assets deployed all over the world. And so you need to manage them. And now in the management of those data, figuring out which sensor is down, which, which sensor is up, figuring out if a sensor needs an update, figuring out if uh, somebody has trying to hack into a sensor or one of these exposed things, all of these require various a type of intelligent analysis of the data being generated. Uh, for And all of those cases, artificial intelligence, both the current generative one as well as traditional ones have a strong role to play. So in some sense, if you generate data and you have to manage data sources, technology like AI are going to be tremendously useful. 
we, we, we've been, like I said, I mean, catapulted in this world where everything is connected, you know, everything is going to be digitized. Now, these growingly digitized world is loaded with pros, you know, but the downside is it also has a cons, you know, like, for example, I've been invested in metaverse and there are these glasses which are coming, which could be possibly as light as this. It, it's packed with sensors, it's packed with cameras, which is tracking outside as well as inside it towards, you know, it's looking inside your eyes. So, so you know, you could be wearing one of these glasses and you could be walking out in the street it's not just kind of understanding your eye gaze uh, and and your mood and things like that but also the external world now uh, what what are some of the effective strategies or technologies that can be employed to ensure the security and privacy of this connected world digital world uh, internet of uh, things that we we are entering no absolutely you're right like no uh, the more we get connected uh, the the more we have security risks, the more we have privacy risks also. And uh, essentially, you have to build in the mechanisms to prevent that. And the mechanism building, in some sense, uh, generates, uh, arises from the need to have the properly structured software. And it is in that case that, uh, in some sense, some of the IoT device manufacturers, unfortunately, have not been doing a great job in trying to put the appropriate security mechanism in there. If you are the an, um, like you know, deploying your own IoT solutions, right? you can take certain actions which can effectively counter that. One, of course, is to make sure that the end device or the sensor that you're putting in has the right software stack, does not, has, doesn't have a known vulnerability. You can put, depending on the configuration, client-side IoT firewalls, just like we have server-side uh, firewalls to protect it. And the uh, secret to keeping things secure and private essentially is constant monitoring of the device systems and enforcing the right policies and guidelines that make sure that the data or information that being collected is both being handled properly, stored properly, and only used for the purposes for which it is being used. So in that sense, uh, if you look at the issues of privacy and risk, as well as privacy and security, as well as the uh, performance, uh, uh, like no uh, performance, uh, sorry, denial of service attacks that can be launched on the system, they are not that much different than that of the ordinary digital world. The one thing difference, the one twist that happens is that any type of um, risk or compromise you do on a physical asset can have some severe. Um, impact on the real world. So for example, if uh, like, no, if I have got a computer and you hack into my, uh, you hack into my computer, somebody breaches my computer. Okay. You have taken over the information on my computer. I've lost some files. Hopefully I have been diligent enough and not kept any of my sensitive information unencrypted on the file. But in the worst case, I'll say, okay, I lost my computer. I lost my phone. Fine. I can't see WhatsApp or like, no, or but no real harm done. On the other hand, if someone hacks into, say, my motorcycle on car and gets it deviated or anything, it can be physically debilitated. I mean, it can be physically very uh, hurtful. So there's a amount of damage that can be done by a compromise in an IoT or connected physical world is much higher than that of a purely uh, uh, digital world. And with, but which means that also we have when we build solutions. We have to architect in the safety mechanisms, the performance. Basically, uh, let's just put it, we cannot put the management of the IoT systems as an afterthought. It has to be built in or designed into the solution right from the very beginning. Uh, the thing is that anyone who is creating the solution, bringing the devices together, the computing platform, the system together, they have to put due attention to that. And which um, I'm sorry to say as software developers or people with pressure to develop, we often uh, tend to neglect or overlook. I hope that, you know, uh, where, while we are building these systems because they are so potential, I hope that, you know, we, we take more precautions in building better place bikes, uh, place bikes, uh, uh, products, services, and solutions. You also have been uh, researching and working on the space of the future of computing. Could you explain the difference between autonomic computing versus co to cognitive computing? Autonomic computing and cognitive computing were terms that were used at different stages. And in some sense, they're similar, 
but in other sense, they are um, quite different. So in autonomic computing, the idea was to create a system that would be effectively self-managing, self-healing, like you no know, self-managing means it will basically look at its own downtown time and like you no know, bring itself up when needed. Uh, it would be uh, provide its own security. It would be uh, like you no know, self-healing, self-configuring. So it wouldn't require a lot of manual automation, and it would be self-optimizing, so that when you run the system, it will figure out what configuration is best for it. So autonomic computing was designed to make the system uh, essentially reduce the amount of human burden or human oversight it is needed to operate most of the software system that are available today. And if you look at it, the um, autonomic computing, which started, I would say, in around early 2000s, like that decade, looked into a lot of activities, which can basically say, how this is how I can reduce the human involvement in having the system run. Cognitive computing, on the other hand, was designed toward the goal of making systems that improve themselves over time. So the idea there was that if you run a system today, it it basically, most of the software systems are static. They're static, they um, operate uh, in a certain configuration, but as the system runs and the system monitors its performance and characteristics, the system could essentially optimize itself to do its job better. Now, when you get to the next level of detail, okay, how would you build an autonomic system? How would you build a cognitive system? The lines begin to blur because a lot of technologies that can make a system autonomic are also the technologies that can make a system cognitive. So in that sense, the difference between autonomic systems and cognitive system is you can, in some cases, you can say, we are drawing a, like, you no know, too fine a line between the two. But, you know, uh, Academically speaking, or being very pedantic, that's the difference between an autonomic and a uh, cognitive, cognitive system. Autonomic is self-managing system. Cognitive is self-improving system. Now, IBM has been one of the pioneers, you know, when it comes to artificial intelligence. It created a Deep Blue, uh, which beat the world champion Gary Kasparov in 1997. Then in 2011, IBM Watson managed to beat a uh, human uh, at the game of Jeopardy. And I believe now Watson has been piv pivoted to Watson X. So where yeah. does IBM stand today? Uh, when it comes to AI, I, I mean, you know, artificial intelligence and it's, does it also have a vision towards building artificial general intelligence? Of course, IBM is strongly behind artificial intelligence. Uh, and I, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, there was an uh, interview given by our CEO, Arvind Krishna, in India itself, where he did mention that he would be expecting about a large percentage of back office jobs to be replaced by uh, uh, artificial intelligence capabilities. So IBM is strongly behind artificial intelligence for business. Now, the fact is that IBM focuses on artificial intelligence applications targeted on, on business concerns as opposed to consumers. So you won't always hear about um, IBM AI advances or IBM AI successes because they have been targeted towards a much more, um, not that public segment of the population. So that makes for slightly less glamorous uh, uh, press. But IBM definitely is strongly behind AI. We are looking at applying AI into all aspects of the uh, of our uh, process. And uh, I think of latest, um, I think just earlier this week, or sorry, last week, IBM announced the AI Alliance because IBM is following an approach of doing open AI with in collaboration with several members of the university, academia, and other technical um, uh, community. And it's investing heavily and trying to make every steps to create safe, trusted, safe and dependable AI with applications towards the business domain. What do you think the future of computing is, is going to be, you know, because we are still in the classical computing era, though there are researchers uh, and companies working in the space of biocomputing, there are the companies working on neuromorphic computing, and then obviously there are leaders in the space such as Google and IBM itself who's working on quantum computing, you know, and just recently I think IBM launched Condor, the the thousand qubit quantum computing chip. So somebody who's been vested in the future of computing, what would you say the future of computing is going to look like? Uh, Predicting anything about the future is very dangerous. <laughs> I mean, the um, 
but we do we can make certain speculative guesses one thing that we know from the past is that every new wave of computing that has happened every new wave of technology it has not replaced the previous thing it has always augmented and supplemented what is existing so if you think of that way like you no know, for example uh, when um, uh, automobile came they did replace bikes or horse wagons but not completely and when trains came they didn't replace automobiles completely and when airplanes came they didn't replace trains completely so they all keep on building upon each other and if you look at the era of different type of computing in software side we had mainframe or centralized computing then we had client servers then we had uh, cloud computing then we had edge computing and all of these essentially build upon each other so now if you look at the apply the same logic and principle one thing that will definitely say that the future of computing is going to be very hybrid so if you look at the infrastructure it probably will be a mix of quantum computers maybe there'll be some other type of computing things that can also come in like for example optical computing or analog computing uh, you could have um, uh, like now there are people who are experimenting with uh, uh, like no with biological computing where they use uh, beehives or like you no know, termite things to essentially build computing systems or chemical uh, equations as a as a computing system in in part or genetic computers so you will have lot of these emerging things and they will be complementing and supplemented by the current technologies of the classical computers similarly if you look at software paradigms there are multiple software paradigms and soft or like if you look at the languages that are done the languages in themselves like you no know, always add on and um, and complement the existing prevalent languages people still uh, write cobol and fortran programs not a lot of them they have been supplanted by the things but the every language or everything will be supplemented so there will be lot of exciting things that will be there but all the only thing we can predict with certainty is that the existing technology will coexist with the new emerging technologies we do know that ai will play a big role in many of those aspects but that again would be a component of the different type of things that exist so apart from saying that will the future will be a mixture of many different type of things and more and more things will be gravitating towards software like just like you see uh, in the internet of things was emerging and combining physical hardware asset with software if you look at what's happening in the telecommunication network domain lot of boxes that were done with uh, in in hardware lot of function that then hardware are gravitating and being done in software now because the machines are getting faster and you can do the software has lot of benefits there uh, if you look at how many physically distinct devices got absorbed into software components onto a phone from flashlights to radio to like no to health monitor and in state measurement all are now software running on phones the other prediction that you can make is that the future of the world is going to be largely software driven and software will be embedded almost everywhere including some places the, the where we may not even think of putting in software for example i there are people uh, researching uh, academic research in what called smart spaces in which the buildings and the cabinets and closets and the walls have got sensors embedded and you can essentially create um, intelligent uh, mobile dynamic uh, spaces that one can live in right right so those are the only two things i am comfortable making prediction it will be hybrid and it will be increasing component of software right thank you sir really really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast and sharing your insights on internet of things uh in the future of computing i think the future looks exciting but like you said i mean you know unless until there is no business or a social case of it and if if we don't have technology that is created for that purpose the society will not uh, you know advance i mean neither there would be anything which is meaningful so uh, uh really really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast and to my listeners if you like what you see in here then please press the subscribe button until next time see you guys bye bye thank you thank you sir thank, thank you, you.